Hi, I'm Misha here. And moving right along with our look at British military jets. We've mostly looked at ones used by the RAF, but today we're going to look at ones used primarily by the British Navy. We have the very famous Hawker Harrier. This is actually the Sea Harrier of the Navy. But first, we're going to talk about this big guy. This is the Black Blackburn Buccaneer. This is the S2 variant used by the Navy. Actually, Hawker Sidley made this one. They made the S2, but the Buccaneer name kind of stuck to the plane as a moniker regardless. This was actually the last Corgi model I was waiting on to do this video. I had to special order it. I thought I did, because this is my biggest British plane, and it was one of the biggest planes used by the British military ever, and one of the biggest used by the Royal Navy. Well, what do we have here? In the early 50s, the British Navy was going up against new Soviet ships, vessels, submarines, including some very fast and mass-produced cruisers. It was considered to build some new classes of ships to combat these, but then it was decided to build aircraft to be strike bombers to destroy, intercept, and destroy. It's a lot cheaper to produce some jets than it is a whole new vessel, even a small one. So in 1952, they laid out specs. The new plane needed to be at least able to go 630 miles per hour carry at least eight tons of ordnance, be standard, conventional, and nuclear capable, and be able to operate from a carrier. Well, by 19, early 53, different companies that were interested in the contract were starting to submit proposals. Fast forward, because bureaucracy and finally in 1955 the design from Blackburn was selected for adoption and development <clears throat> fast forward to 1958 and the prototype first took to the air it passed and these started to enter the Navy in 1962 and were first operational at the first squadrons in 1963 <clears throat> and originally that was the S1 variant which is very similar to this but it had one critical issue it was underpowered its jet engines just didn't give enough thrust to get it off the deck fully loaded and fully fully fueled up <laughs> so and this was a known issue even really before these had entered service in 1962 they were working on the S2 with new engines and at this time Blackburn all of their assets became part of Hawker Sidley so they worked on the S2 and in 1965 the first S2's were started to be delivered to the Navy 
Also that year, these were cleared to carry nuclear weapons. And by 1966, the transition to the S2 was complete. It was really pretty important to go to the new powerful engines. Once they got that done, they found that the new engines not only delivered more power, they were also more fuel efficient. It did require some slight redesigning of the wing and engine nacelles, but it was worth the time. And so yeah, the Navy started receiving. What did they get? Well, as I said, this is a maritime, the seaborne strike craft. It's very big. Over 63 feet long. With a wingspan of just under 45 feet. It could get up to about 650 miles per hour and get up to about 40,000 feet. It was designed to come in fast and low and basically toss a bomb and leave. To that end, it was not equipped with a cannon. It had four underwing pylons for bombs or missiles or fuel tanks and it also had a bomb bay on, on the bottom the belly which could rotate to drop a conventional or nuclear weapon out kind of reminds me a bit of the uh, F-105 Thunder Chief has a crew of two a pilot and a weapons and Systems officer. It was popular with the pilots. It was relatively easy to fly. It had some advanced computer systems for that day and time. It was designed to be a durable aircraft to withstand the rigors of carrier operations. But its days were relatively short in the Navy. Because right as the S-2 was coming into service, a profound change happened. In 1966, it was discussed about either making a new class of modern aircraft carrier, larger, bigger, better. In the end, they went the opposite direction and decided to retire all of their big carriers. Because they were just aging out and they had to do something. So by 1968 the plan was put into place and by 1970 carriers started to be retired out of service. And of course as they did the buccaneers serving on board them were also retired because they had nothing to operate them with. The last buccaneers in the Navy were retired in 1978 when the HMS Arc Royale was decommissioned and that was it. During the 60s and 70s these were primarily used as kind of a deterrence force a patrol force in the North Sea. They were used in a few show of force and attack missions over the years but nothing too major. But that's not the end of the story. There's also a story with the Royal Air Force. In 1957, as it was getting ready to fly the prototype for the Navy, Buccaneer suggested to the Air Force it might like this, because it was looking for a new light bomber. It made a version known as the B-103 which was this, but with more fuel. They also had a more modified version with more specialized things for the Air Force, known as the B-108. The Air Force absolutely did not bite. They said the planes were too slow, too slow, too slow, and did not have the range. 
but really it just was they didn't want a Navy plane. This was designed for the Navy's requirements by the Navy, and they just they didn't want a Navy plane. They wanted their own. Didn't work out so well for them. The first plane they picked in 1959, a plane from British Aerospace, never worked out. The project was canceled for multiple reasons, including money. Then they selected the General Dynamics F-111, which I do have a video on. A version called the F-111K was intended for the RAF, but as you know, that project hit lots of bumps in 65, 66, and by 68, cost overruns and performance issues caused the RAF to back out just as the U.S. Navy did with the F-111B. So a decade on, they still didn't have a light bomber replacement. And at the same time, as I said a minute ago, the Royal Navy was planning to retire theirs forcibly. So, a decision was made to transfer Navy S-2s to the Air Force, which the Air Force designated as S-2A. In addition, Hawker Sidley made a version to the Air Force's requirements with several upgrades and modernizations known as the S-2B. Some of the Navy planes would be upgraded to the S-2B. In addition, 46 new S-2Bs would be made for the Air Force and this would be added to the 84 surplus Navy planes. So they would have a pretty good number, about 130. And they start taking deliveries in 1969 and putting them through their paces. This would take over ground attack, ground strike duties from the Navy now that they lost the capacity to do so. They would continue to carry nuclear weapons. However, the Royal Air Force would be using these in war games and stuff throughout the 70s and in 1980 they had a plane crash. They investigated, they found out that planes were starting to have stress fractures in the airframes. I mean, some of these planes are getting on 20 years at this point. So it was decided to select 60 of the planes in the fleet, upgrade those to a new standard, and scrap or cut the rest up for spare parts. And there it goes. Now originally, the idea was this was only going to be a temporary replacement until the Panavia Tornado came in. But delays with the tornado meant that they had to rely on this much longer than they had originally anticipated. But the tornado started to appear in 1983 and slowly would phase out operational buccaneer squadrons. However, they were still flying during the 1999 Gulf War and were deployed they were sent over into the Gulf in January, and they first saw combat missions in February. And they'd actually fly together with the tornado, doing laser designating, dropping laser bombs, so on and so forth, and proved quite effective. They were also quite good dive bombers. They would dive bomb and knock out tanks and armored personnel transports. They proved to be a good plane. And they were originally planned to be kept in service through the decade. However, after the Gulf War, and more importantly, the end of the Cold War, once again, the British government cut military budgets. So, by 1993, only one squadron of Buccaneers was flying in the RAF. And even it was retired in March of 1994. And that is this plane's history. So, reasonably successful. It just ended up being more successful with the branch that it wasn't initially made for, and the branch that initially rejected it twice. I guess the third time's the charm, right? Um, did its role. Like a lot of these specialized planes from the 50s, luckily it was never called upon to deliver a nuclear weapon. And it's just a neat British carrier plane has kind of its own design the fuselage and everything was kind of made with the whole aerial rule which 
you've seen a lot of the Century Series planes to try to increase performance. Well, once this was retired out of the Royal Navy, its place started to be taken over by this plane. So we go from the biggest plane in the Navy to perhaps one of the smallest. All right, now we're getting to it. <laughs> There's just not much out there on the Blackburn, Blackburn Buccaneer. And there's tons out there on the Harrier. By the way, I can't remember if I said they made a 211 of the Buccaneers, all versions. Of course, remembering that nearly half of that were recycled. So, But you, you start to see the numbers of production go down from, you know, thousands to hundreds. Kind of tells you the economics of the British... Air Force and Navy at this point. On to the Harrier. Specifically, this is the Sea Harrier. Originally developed by Hawker Sidley. Later, it would be picked up by British Aerospace when several things were combined. I'm not going to go much into the history of the Army Marine Air Force Harrier. That's for another video. And uh, you can find that in our AV-8 video. I'll just say that the very first Harrier prototype flew successfully in 1960. And a more refined version flew in 1967. And it was adopted into the RAF on April Fool's Day, 1969. And they would continue to produce them at least the original Harrier versions, like the GR-1 through GR-3. Yes, Hobo, I know. She's used to being in here if I do gun videos, but I don't know if I trust her with model videos. Yes, Hobo. And it would remain in RAF service until 2006 and be used extensively during the Falklands War in 1982. But that was a version meant to operate primarily over the solid Earth. For the Navy, they needed their own specialized version. As I said in 1966, future plans for large carriers were canceled. 1968-1970, the new Invincible class cruiser, quote-unquote cruiser, was planned. It was a small aircraft carrier, like an escort style, but politically this wasn't. A, they didn't want to be called an aircraft carrier. It probably wouldn't get funding, so they called it a cruiser. And uh, the first, of course, was HMS Invincible. So once the, uh, the new not-carrier carrier was well underway... They issued a contract in order for a sea-based version of the Harrier in 1975. Originally, they wanted two dozen of them. Then in 1978, right as the first prototype was getting ready to fly, they upped the order to 34. And it's really good that um, the first prototype did fly in 1978 in August because, uh, yeah, the last of the old large carriers... HMS Ark Royal was retired that year. So, yeah, cutting it a little close there, guys. <laughs> Nevertheless, it still wasn't quite ready for prime time. 
the Navy received their first Harriers in 1980 and declared them operational and ready to go in 1981. So there still was a little bit of a gap. They were originally known as the FRS-1 for Fighter Reconnaissance Strike. And yes, this would be taking over the roles of many planes, including the Buccaneer. Interestingly, while this is a much smaller plane, it did have a respectable payload for a V-Stall craft. It is about 46 feet long, so a little bit longer than a lot of World War II era planes, but very small by the standards of the 1970s and 80s. Has a very short wingspan of only 25 feet. Now, American Harriers like the AV-8B have a slightly wider wingspan of 30 feet. This has the smaller. And it would have four underwing pylons for ordnance, as well as a fifth under the fuselage. And it would have two pods, one on each side, holding 30 millimeter cannon. All told, they could lift 8,000 pounds. Not bad. And, you know, that's the original requirement for the Blackburn back in the 50s. And, of course, this is V-Stall capable. It can go over 700 miles per hour, but it's still subsonic. And it can get up over 50,000 feet. So it has a higher ceiling than the old Buccaneer. These were just ready in time to be deployed during the Falklands War. They were on HMS Invincible, as well as HMS Hermes. And while their combat record was not perfect, they actually did prove the design. I mean, considering it had just gone into service, they, they worked out well in that war. And they also flew alongside and cooperated with their GR3 cousins from the RAF. And afterwards, kind of looking at lessons learned, what worked and what didn't, in 1984, requirements for an updated version, initially known as the FRS-2, were laid out. And it would first fly in September of 1988. And that's what this exact version is here. By this point, though, it was renamed the FA-2. And originally they would convert 29 of their FA-1s or FRS-1s. And then they would order about 20 brand new planes in 1990. And the new FA-2 started to see service in 1993, so right after the Gulf War. The original version saw service in the Gulf War. They would keep delivering planes to the Navy through the 90s. But then in 2002, it was decided that they would phase the Sea Harrier and the regular Harrier, for that matter, in the RAF, out of service. And replace them with the upcoming Lockheed F-35B. So in 2006, they were decommissioned. Problem is, the F-35B, if nothing else, was extremely late in coming in like 10 years late and much more expensive than initially planned so again they, they seem in a hurry to retire things in the British government without having more than just a theoretical replacement they kind of got lucky that the sea carrier was pretty much ready to go when the buccaneer was retired but they didn't get so lucky second go round.
in all, they would make 111 Harriers, enough to suit British needs. Of course, that's not counting ones made in America. Again, topic for another video. Now, the other models in this series have all been Corgi, but surprisingly, they don't have many Harriers. This one here is from Hobby Master. In fact, it just came out earlier this year. This isn't their first Harrier. They've done some in the past, but they mostly did the U.S. Marines versions, the AV-8s. This year, they're doing three British versions, including two Sea Harriers and at least one GR-7 variant, so that's pretty neat. There are differences between the American and the British. For example, the canopy. Also, the uh, underwing loadout is different. The thrust vector nozzles are different. More than you might think at first glance, honestly. The Hobby Master models may have a little better detail and definitely more flexibility than the Corgi. But honestly, they're not as heavy. They're, they're metal. They use a lot of metal. But, but they don't have quite the heft that most of your Corgis do. I don't know. I, sometimes I wonder if they put lead bricks in the middle of the Corgis because some of them are just very heavy. Then again, it is a small plane. So, what do you expect? But I wouldn't mind getting a Corgi Harrier one day just to compare. But definitely one of the cool planes to have. I mean, it's a Harrier. It was really the first and only successful V-Stall plane of its era. Everything else that they tried from the 60s and even 70s did not work out. And heck, the F-35B barely worked out. I mean, I, I think they've they've got it ironed out now, but it took long enough. And uh, Russian efforts, while promising when they got into like the Yak-41, you know, they had their own issues and things. But yeah, two British Navy ships. Planes, I mean, sorry. Yeah, I've been talking for a while, so there you go. My excuse. One maybe not so famous, but one definitely famous. Well, we're ha more than halfway through now, but we will continue on with this series. And get to what's next. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.